Hello, everyone. Thank you. Thank you for being here. My name is Eric Huey. I'm the Senior Vice President of Government Affairs for the Entertainment Software Association. Are you too kind? No. Don't stop. Come on. Ah. Uh, thank, thank, thanks so much for being here. We're really excited uh, to, to have this conversation about uh, America's tech economy and, and uh, where we're going as not just this industry, but, but as a, an entertainment tech, a technology industry uh, into the 21st century. We want to thank uh, our friends at the uh, E-Tech Caucus and our four co-chairs, uh, Chairman Lamar Smith, Chairman Go Jim McGovern, Chairman Adam Kinzinger, and Chairman, Chairwoman De Debbie Wasserman Schultz for their tireless support in this, the fourth year of the E-Tech Caucus. And we want to thank our friends in the Higher Education Video Game Alliance, aka HEVGA, uh, for all of their help in the research around this. HEVGA is the consortium of the top 80 plus different uh, video game colleges and universities around the country that are teaching these courses and providing the workforce of the uh, future. So it's uh, with, with, with great uh, pride that we, that we uh, gather together. You can tell by the, uh, the, the aromatic fragrance of Chick-fil-A in, in, in the background <laughs> that it's a congressional briefing and an E-Tech caucus briefing. Thrilled that you're here uh, because what we're going to see today is a portrait of an industry uh, in flux, an industry that is growing, an industry that is dynamic, and an, an industry that is geographically dispersed throughout the entire United States. You think a lot about, about the tech industry, the entertainment industry, and you may think of places like um, the Bay Area, or Austin, Texas, or uh, Seattle, Washington, or, or Boston, but what we're going to hear about today is the fact that these creative clusters are spread throughout uh, all 50 states, and that there are colleges and universities and startups that are, uh, that are contributing to, the, to this burgeoning 21st century digital tech economy. So with that, I want to introduce the man at the epicenter of the 21st century digital tech economy, Mike Gallagher, the president and CEO. Mike is now in his eighth year as, as the CEO, uh, ninth year as the, as, as, as the CEO, and uh, uh, was, uh, has, has been at the helm over a, the growth of this industry from an industry where, where it comprised primarily of, of uh, shiny silver disks to now an industry that has grown to 23 billion here domestically, 87 billion worldwide. Uh, he's overseen a Supreme Court victory, a seven to two US Supreme Court victory. And uh, the, the growth of the industry, the growth of ESA and the increased prominence of ESA. So without any further ado, please welcome Mike Young. Thank you, Eric, and it's a delight to be back here on the House uh, side. For those of you that know me personally, you know that I uh, come from here as a staffer. It's great to be back. There's a lot of energy here and a lot of excitement, and it's where great work gets done. I very much appreciate the, the hosts, our congressional hosts, that are uh, providing us the opportunity to share this information uh, with, uh, with everyone for the first time. Uh, the discussion you have today is all about the data here, which is being revealed this morning. Very appreciative of that. I'm appreciative of the leadership of the staff that are here today and the work, hard work that you do, um, making sure that your members are um, fully informed about all that's going on. And it's a big world with a lot happening, and uh, those are heavy burdens. We appreciate your time in sharing that with us today. Also, really appreciate the participation, support, and leadership of the panel that's going to share some perspectives with us. It's a terrific group. We've worked closely with each one of them for years now, and to have their perspective and their um, real sense of what this means, and to share that with you in this hour, along with the Chick-fil-A, it's a great opportunity, and <laughs> we're really pleased to be here. Um, so th this is, as Eric mentioned, a case study in the digital economy. What you have happening to our industry over the last at least 20 years, but certainly accelerating uh, to a great degree in the last five, is what happens when you have a robust entertainment medium a medium that is enjoyed by uh, hundreds of millions of people across, the, billions across the world, nearly two billion, and, and over 150 million here in the US. When you infuse it with broadband, when you add spectrum, when you have smart policies around privacy and data security and copyright and all of those pieces, look at what you get. And to have a conversation about how those elements intertwine, there's no better place than right here uh, in this room. And as we're gonna see uh, more detail, you know, we're very proud as an association, as an industry association, to say that 84% of congressional districts have a video game facility or a video game uh, a program in their district. 
That shows the remarkable connection that there is across a country, not just in um, a handful of places. Um, also, when you tie that to what does that mean for the economy or for those individuals, for the very fortunate about 150,000 people that work in the industry, the average wage is $95,000 a year. These are the jobs that really drive our economy forward. And we've been growing them, but it's significantly faster than the rate of the overall growth of the economy. So this is one of those things where uh, policymakers can look and see what's working and hopefully learn the lessons and model future decisions based upon where we are right now. Now, another aspect of what the video game industry does is it drives growth across a number of sectors, whether it's healthcare or other forms of research or simulation or the new budding uses of virtual reality and augmented reality technologies uh, that are just beginning to reach uh, the level of being introduced into the consumer marketplace. All of these things have their roots in the video game industry. And it's a, it's a credit to the passion of the gamer. It's a credit to the entrepreneurial spirit of the risk takers that say, I know what I can do. I can make a great game. I can make a fantastic product, whether it's Star Wars or Fallout um, or Halo, which, all of which are coming in the next few weeks. Um, to have, I'll make that investment, take that risk, and I'll energize consumers to be so engaged with us that they'll continue to drive these types of numbers. But it has offshoots into engineering and healthcare and other government and other purposes. And we have great testimonials to that that can be offered from our panelists. So we continue to grow, um, in, as I mentioned, substantially outpace the economy because we've become a mass market medium. Because the average age of a gamer is 35 years old and they've been playing an average of 13 years. It's a very much embedded part of our entertainment culture, um, and it's, a, it's an exciting place to be. Uh, it's certainly an exciting um, position for us as the trade association to represent them. Now, we're particularly appreciative to have this discussion here because the issues that I mentioned at the outset, as well as other issues like immigration, these are the issues, this is the forum where those are decided, where those are discussed, where those policies are set. And the better and more wise decisions that Congress can make, the farther this industry and others like it can grow. So we're very pleased to share um, the, the, the good feedback here, along with some thoughts about where we should be going on the road ahead. So as our artists continue to push the edge of the envelope, as our investors continue to drive um, investments in new technologies and new experiences, uh, we're excited to share uh, this news with everyone in this room and then with uh, everyone um, outside of this room shortly thereafter. Uh, it's been an exciting first 40 years as an industry. And who knows what the next 40 hold. Now before I um, uh, sur surrender the podium to those who are much smarter than me, um, I want to give special credit to one person in this room for the bulk of the information that you see on here. Uh, Katie McCourt, who is seated, seated right over here, um, was one of our interns last summer and did an absolutely outstanding, painstaking, high attention to detail job in developing uh, virtually every number that you see. So thank you, Katie, for your hard work in doing that. Uh, thank you, Eric, for uh, uh, guiding us on through the rest of the program. And thank you all for being here. Thank you, Mike. Uh, thank you for your remarks and for your ongoing leadership of, of, of the industry. Uh, I want to now introduce uh, Andy Phelps from the Rochester Institute of Technology. And you've all heard the song, uh, I was country before country was cool. That applies doubly so to Andy <laughs> Phelps, because he was a lone voice in the wilderness uh, in educating the students of, of, of yesterday, today, and tomorrow in, in, in video games. He started, his, he started at RIT, he, ha he now heads the Center for Ma uh, Media, Arts, Games, Interaction, and Creativity, AKA the Magic Center. He founded it, he heads it, and in 2001, he first started teaching game programming at RIT. And he's a former college athlete and also an artist, a, a, a true right brain, left brain uh, thinker, and you see that manifested in the program at RIT. In 2006, it grew to be a master's program. In 2007, it grew to uh, be a bachelor's program. And then it became a freestanding school of its own within the university in 2011. They are ranked by the Princeton Review, which ranks these things as one of the top five uh, schools in video game design as both an undergraduate institution and as, a, uh, and as an institution that awards master's degrees. And he educates over 700 students per year in his, in, in his program. So uh, would please welcome to the podium, Andy Phelps. Thanks. Okay, uh, 
let's just get right into it. Um, so this is kind of interesting stuff, right? And uh, you know, it, it still kind of blows people away, right? My mom is still surprised that this is actually a thing that people do with their lives. <laughs> right? um, you know, 1,871 game company locations, you know, 1,600 game companies, right? Uh, the thing that I think is really interesting on this slide, right, is, is not just that it's everywhere, right, but this, this bit about 83% of game companies having less than 50 employees, right, and we're going to come back to that and look at that in a little bit more detail. Right, so, you know, the top three states, right, California, Texas, New York, right, this, this doesn't seem surprising, right, this is sort of everybody's recollection, um, right, ranked by uh, representative, so forth. Um, and this one kind of breaks down, right, game, loca game company locations by type, right? So if we look at studios, publishers, developers, we've got 1,755. If you look at information technology, business to business firms, that kind of stuff, you're much smaller number, right? Even smaller number of association, even smaller number of purely game technology companies. But what this really means is this means that the bulk of the work is in content production, content creation and production, right? This is really about they're making the things that you play, more so than just infrastructure, just as does that, right? Okay. Uh, number of game developer publishers and distributors by LinkedIn employee count. So this is digging into that number a little bit that we talked about earlier. So 865 of them are one to 10, right? So we're talking about really, really small businesses. We're talking about startups. We're talking about little groups of people making little things that you might play on your phone or on your this or on your that and they're you know they're really hungry and they're really after it and they're doing great wonderful things and then you've got some behemoths out there right that we've all we're all familiar with right because they make the things that you know we just heard about that i'm excited to play this holiday season so the top 15 states um, just by looking at all the companies this includes right the, the b2b companies the, the that kind of stuff uh, California, Texas, New York, but then very quickly into Washington, Massachusetts, Illinois, Florida, Oregon, Georgia, North Carolina, Arizona, on and on and on and on, right? And we see those same states that fluctuates a little bit based on if we just kind of pull out just the content product, content creation and production companies, just the pure game companies, um, but not a lot. Right? Um, top districts, right? So we can slice it by district, we can slice it by, um, by geographic location, we can slice it by lots of stuff and choose done a wonder here and, and all this stuff, uh, figuring out how to drill down into all of this stuff. Right? And then we get into game programs, right? And so game programs, right, 406 schools now offer degrees, <coughs> concentrations, certificates, and minors in game studies, game design, game something or other. The nomenclature is really loose across the academic field because we don't standardize on anything. We all want to feel very special. Uh, but that kind of curriculum, right, is now really, really widespread. 327 offer courses, 255 degrees offered in game studies, an average of eight schools offering programs per state, right? 45 states offer programs in game studies, right? And, and this is where it gets really exciting, right? So that 406 number last year was 315. So that's a huge number of academic institutions. Um, I'm not sure how, how familiar everyone is with academics. Um, having lived my life in academics, we typically move really, really slow. Right? That's what we do. We're good at it. We have processes to make sure we move slow. Right? And yet we're moving really quickly. So what's actually happening there? And when we really think about how we're moving, so uh, you know, I was cool before I was cool or whatever that was. So way back in 2001, we were doing our survey work to create our programs at RIT. I was standing up in front of academic senate saying, we should have a course on this, stuff like that. And they said, nobody's doing that. Go out and look and see how many people are doing that. We found eight. In 2001, we found eight. And now we're at 406 in the climate. So the number of schools by program type, right? So 255 majors, 82 concentrations, 108 certificates, 51 minors, 88 associate programs, 172 bachelor programs, 40 master programs, 
but only three doctorate programs right now. Right? So clearly there's going to be some growth there, I would wager a guess. And then this gets kind of interesting, right? So when you think about early adopters in higher ed, right, you'll typically get your private tech schools, stuff like that, are, are kind of first to market on some of those things um, because they can take some risks that often public institutions can't. Um, and, you know, there's sort of an innovative ethic to some of those schools. Uh, then it kind of moves into, you know, sort of your more traditional state schools, down into the community college system, stuff like that. And now we're starting to see it move into historically black colleges. Right? Um, so here are several right, that are now offering courses and a couple with concentrations and one with a, a degree program. And also into all women's colleges. Right? So again, a um, couple with a program, several now with courses. And so we're seeing that effort around diversity. We're seeing that drive within, within both the industry and within the field and within education to sort of be all inclusive Right, is now starting to take hold as more and more of these programs emerge. Uh, top states by programs only, right? California, Texas, Pennsylvania, Florida, my home state, New York, North Carolina, Arizona, so on, right? And we can again slice by district, slice by, by program, et cetera. Hit it again. And this is the this is the takeaway. This is the real important one, right? So when we look at where those companies were located. When we look at where people are doing this, this kind of work, where this industry is succeeding, you know, you can see on the map, and, and we'll talk about this, right, that it's kind of everywhere, right? But there's a really, really strong correlation of where the programs are that are producing this talent and where that industry is thriving, right? And so the big takeaway here, I think, is when you have a university producing this kind of talent coupled with, right, either incubator programs or tech transfer programs or startup programs, right, work by states, governments, and, and national governments, and the right policies, right, that allows people to grow into this industry, right, and drives this little kind of wheel where the school is producing stuff that's creating these companies, and then these companies are working with schools to revise and revamp their programs and make this system work. And it's good for everybody because it grows the economy and it grows the school and people are getting great jobs and getting well educated and so forth. And that's it. <laughs> we'll ask our esteemed panelists to join us, uh, join us up here. Um, the idea for this map really grew out of a conversation that, that, that Andy and I had at the very first Higher Education Video Game Alliance meeting, because I said, if you've got 700 students in your program, where do they get jobs afterwards? And he said, not surprisingly, the number one employer of my students, whether they're undergraduate or graduate, is Microsoft. That kind of follows, it's a video game designed program, and one would expect that to go to Microsoft. He said, well, what's interesting, this year, the number three employer was Lockheed Martin. So people with undergraduate and graduate degrees are coming out with degrees in video game design and going to work uh, to, to, at places like Lockheed Martin and places like Amazon and Google and tech industry um, uh, uh, startups. And that's, that's the part that really interests me said, because the, the, the number that's not being captured are the, the number of my students who stay in a place like Rochester and start video game companies here in the town where they grew up or the town where they went to college. They're not all necessarily going to the Bay Area or to Boston or, or, or to Austin. A lot of them are staying here. And that's when that got, that got us thinking that there is this great you know, uh, expanse of, 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 of companies that are less than 50 employees. We all know the big companies in this space. They're, they're household names like Electronic Arts and Activision and, uh, and Take Two and Ubisoft and Warners and Disney, Sony, Xbox, Nintendo. But on all of those platforms and on mobile and on PC, there's this entire startup uh, ecosystem. And this is the first comprehensive look that we've had at that ecosystem and how truly extensive it is. And that got us thinking a lot about creative clusters and where they form. And we had a meeting at the, de at the Department of Commerce about a year and a half ago, and they said, well, how can we replicate the Austin, Texas miracle? I mean, are there other little Austins that, that, that are waiting to be born? And what we said was, we think that they're already there and they're growing. We just, 
uh, as a society aren't doing a great job at counting them or capturing them. And we ought to be thinking about what we can do to, to seed these, these creative clusters throughout the US. And what we found is there are, when you look at the places where there have been success in our industry, because oftentimes our industry is a leading economic indicator of where a, an, an entertainment tech uh, cluster may, may spring, uh, there are four or five indicators that, that demonstrate whether, whether you will see growth in, in this space. One of which is, 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 as Andy alluded to, is, uh, is the existence of a university. That a university with programs in the creative arts. The second one is a VC money com uh, community, so somebody who will invest in, in, in it. The other one are, are graduates of the university uh, who, who oftentimes settle in the area uh, and, and, and create companies of their own. And then generally there's an economic development component, often at the state and local level, sometimes in conjunction with state passed tax incentives that help to grow and incubate this. And obviously there, there was an incubator accelerator component to this as well. So what we wanted to do in the course of this panel was look at every single one of those verticals and have a representative from, from each. So we've got two representatives from, from, from um, the academic field, but one who worked in the White House, one who's grown companies of his own. We've got, we've got a, uh, one of the bright lights of the video game industry who, along with his brother, uh, and I'll give you all proper introductions a bit, started a company that has now grown into one of the foremost uh, companies in this space and is redefining the video game uh, the video game industry at large. And we have somebody in economic development from a state like Texas that can really show us how, how, how they did it. So I want to introduce you to our panelists, starting uh, to Andy's right with Constance uh, Steinkohler, who is the executive director of the Higher Education Video Game uh, Alliance. She is an associate professor of digital media at the University of Wisconsin at Madison. She's the co-director of the Games and Learning uh, so uh, Society at, uh, in, in Madison, Wisconsin. And as I mentioned, she's the head of HEVCA. She also worked at the White House in the Office of, Op in the Office of Science Technology Policy, where she was a senior advisor to the president on games for impact and games for good and utilizing game technology across a range of different um, uh, media. And one of the things she did while she was there, and she'll talk a little bit more about that experience, was organize what she calls the Federal Gaming Guild, which was, uh, which she thought was a small group of people in a variety of different, um, uh, different uh, spots within the federal government who were already in the gaming space, and not just at DOD and NASA, but at places like the Department of Agriculture, and places you would never expect. And she organized them together to learn from each other and, and, and leverage upon the work that they were, they were doing. To her right, we have uh, Guha Bala, as I mentioned. Uh, he co-founded Vicarious Visions in 1991 in high school um, with his brother uh, in, in, in uh, upstate New York. He, they're based in Albany. They started in, in Rochester. And uh, he, he, they then joined Activision Blizzard in 2005. And they're the, they've got, done over four billion in retail sales, and they've sold over 45 million software. You may know them from such hit titles as obviously Skylanders, uh, Guitar Hero, Crash Bandicoot, uh, Tony Hawk, Spider-Man, and Marvel Ultimate Alliance. Um, their awards, uh, critical acclaim, include a BAFTA, Nickelodeon's Parents' Choice, and Game of the Year. So uh, we're thrilled to have uh, uh, Guha down to talk, talk a little bit about Vicarious Vision's journey uh, from, from startup, and, and literal startup in a garage, to where, to where it, it is now in upstate New York with his products traveling around the world. And then to Guha's right, we have Heather Page, the director of the Texas Film Commission, who joined as, as, as the commissioner in 2012. Prior to that, she did uh, workforce training and uh, starting in 2007, created the Texas uh, Commission's workforce training program. We've worked very closely with Heather and, uh, and her team there in Austin in growing the, the Texas video game sector into what it is now over, and you'll see the numbers in, in Texas and throughout the state. In Austin alone, there are 5,000 people who, who work in the video game industry. That was not the case 10 years ago, and that growth is largely due to the terrific work that the Texas and her, and her team, uh, that Heather and her team in Texas have done. So why don't we, uh, why don't we get started, and uh, I'll move to this mic. Make it official here. So why don't we start, Heather, why don't we start with you? What, what's in the water in Austin well, and, and throughout the state of Texas? What makes it such an epicenter? We're talking about creative clusters. And whenever you have a conversation about creative clusters, you have a conversation about Austin. And everybody wants to be the next Austin. How did it, they do it? 
where was this, you know, 10 years ago, and how did you guys hockey stick this up to where it is now? Um, I think that uh, Texas has always been an incredibly creative place where a bunch of different types of people get together and do all sorts of uh, different things. Um, so it really was a bit in the water. Uh, we had, at least for Austin and Dallas and Houston, lots of things that helped the uh, community start from the get-go. We had really supportive educational programs and systems. We also had uh, sort of generation one um, video game makers like Warren Spector and, um, you know, who chose to stay in Texas, build their lives in Texas, and uh, uh, stuck around and sort of uh, really inspired the next generation. We also have a community uh, where uh, there was a lot of technology growth, uh, particularly in the past 15 years. And so uh, that aspect of education um, really grew within the, um, the public and private school systems as well. And then I think that one of the most important things was there were places where people could be themselves, uh, be proud of where they lived, enjoyed everything from music to uh, living outdoors and um, the inexpensive cost of living there. There was just a lot going on that made it a really uh, quality of life place to live and try and build uh, what people wanted to build for themselves. And that's what I think had a lot to do with Texas's and uh, particularly Austin's success. Keep Austin weird. Yeah. Yeah, it was a place, I mean, starting with Willie Nelson Ford. I mean, there was, there was very much an artistic community there. And it was, a, you know, everybody from uh, you know, Willie and the music scene in Austin and Stevie Ray through Richard Linklater and, and filmmakers like that, uh, that, that really became the epicenter of, of what is now grown into this, this, this true, you know, creative, creative economy. Right, and I, I think that people's off time was as important to their success as their on time. And that's what made Austin such a particularly good place um, for this type of growth at that particular time. Add to that the opportunity to perhaps find some capital and an, educa uh, sup an, educative, an educational support system, um, sort of the attitude in Austin that you can do anything you want and we support you at your creative endeavor. Because let's, uh, let's face it, most of these folks that started, started this because they had a creative idea, not necessarily because they wanted to start a business. And as they've grown and sophisticated, you know, their business acumen has had to increase and all of those kinds of things that make a production company really successful, um, you know, grows with them. But it was the creative spark and, a, and the chance that they would all uh, spend time with each other off the clock and, um, you know, self-pollinate and pollinate each other's ideas that really um, got it going. Perfect. And then obviously there was the incentive, which we'll get back to in, 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 in a little bit. But it, as we were preparing, we were talking a little bit about the creative economy, and we were talking about kind of the Dr. Richard Florida idea of, of, of the rise of the creative class. What, what keeps a, uh, what makes a, uh, a, a group of creatives converge in a, in, a, in a single place? And we talked about the great democratizing uh, aspect of, of the internet. And the fact that, that now you can have that kind of Austin weird experience in a whole range of different in a range of different places, and creatives can can gather uh, uh, not just in four or five different places, but, uh, but 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 anywhere. And I'm reminded of of the Tennessee Williams quote from the beginning of the 20, 20th century, where he said there are only three American cities. There are, uh, there, there's New York, there's San Francisco, and, and, and there's New Orleans. Everything else is Cleveland. And, and, and I think you know, that, that has now flipped itself on its head in the beginning of the 21st century. Everywhere in terms of the offering of you know, artisanal food and farm to table restaurants and, 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 and a cool music scene. And if you have, as Mike mentioned, if you've got broadband, you, you've got access to the entire world. And so everywhere can be a San Francisco or an Austin. And we're seeing that reflected for the first time in the map. And upstate New York, Guha, is certainly one of those places. 
And um, I'd love to hear a little bit about the journey of, 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 of your journey in Vicarious, how you grew that, and then what the scene was like in 1991, the scene, in, uh, in, 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 ro in Rock and Rock Cha Cha, and then, and, then, and then Albany and how that's grown in Upstate. So, you know, when I talk about this, uh, and I meet people, people would say, wow, I can't think of anything more incongruous than a creative business in Albany, New York. And, uh, you know, there's a pretty uh, entrenched uh, um, identity around the capital of the state that's really focused around the state. Uh, when we started in 1990, uh, we were in Rochester. Uh, my brother and I were looking for things to do. We met a guy that had just quit his job at Kodak, started a company, he said, hey, come to my basement, I started a company, and we would not recommend our children doing that at this point. <laughs> uh, and so we went, and, we went and met him, he actually had a company in his basement and didn't do anything weird. Uh, and so, he, and, but he was building sound cars he, from his basement, and it was at the time that uh, PCs would just do little bleeps and bloops and that kind of thing, and he invented a whole new way to do music generation for PCs, and it actually started a wave, actually, of technologies. Um, and he said, well, what do you guys like to do? And he handed, uh, we said, well, we like to play video games. We have some creative ideas. He handed uh, us a book on programming and an animation package and said, go learn it, go do it. And so that was actually, that's been a recurring pattern, or was a recurring pa pattern in our early days. The combination of local entrepreneurs being really supportive, uh, being really open to, just new ideas, not being afraid to do, to just have a couple of kids with no resources. It was, we were an independent developer when indie wasn't cool uh, <laughs> at that time. Uh, it, it is actually very cool to be an indie now, uh, and the ecosystem really supports that. Uh, my brother went to college at Rensselaer Polytechnic Institute, and the reason why he chose that place, and RPI is in Troy, New York, right opposite the Hudson River from Albany, uh, is because they have a business incubator that really allowed the students that had good ideas to, you know, get into a place with, uh, you know, people with similar ideas. And it hooked them up with angel investors that not only provided some small amount of seed capital, but the mentorship to say, how do I think about this not as a technology, not just as a creative experience, but also as a business as well. Mm -hmm. We had produced our first couple of titles through college and had no money, actually, the first title that we made, and we had it over the gold master disc and never got a phone call back. So. You know, it's a pretty tough place to do business when you have no business experience, but the confluence of the educational institution, a small amount of seed capital, entrepreneurs that are really willing, that are local success stories, that are willing to invest, this occurs in all kinds of different communities. We saw it in Rochester, and it's a big part of why that's a vibrant entrepreneurial community. We see that in Albany as well. And that was the environment that really made us stay in upstate New York. We had a handshake deal that said, well, if you keep your business here and don't move the headquarters, we'll give you a small amount of money, but we'll help you grow the business. And that was really important for us, you know, having done our, cut our teeth on our first couple creative works, and we were in the starving artist category at that point. <laughs> um, so from there, it was a steady focus on game company. We may have been the first game company in upstate New York altogether, including Western, but certainly the uh, first in our area. There's no local talent that we could hire, so I remember in 1999, I went to China myself to recruit artists, find artists from there, place the newspaper ads to do so. Uh, did the same thing in Russia and Moscow. Did the immigration paperwork myself to get them over here. Some of those people are still with us at Vicarious today, years later. And that starts a bit of a flywheel. You start a critical mass of talent, along with a critical mass of local companies, uh, and that kind of thing. A university system that eventually developed, uh, like Andy mentioned, to create a game program and now provide trained professionals uh, that are a good source for recruiting. And we started making excellent work that became economically sustainable as well. Um, we, one of our early customers was Activision uh, and uh, we, made, we had a lot of commercial success together with Activision uh, and we sold the business to them in 2005 and since we've done a lot of great work together as well. Uh, in the last 10 years we've invested more than $250 million into our local community just in terms of local jobs, local home ownership, all of that stuff. Um, and I think the, the one thing that I would add to the catalyst, outside mm -hmm. of higher education and, and uh, a little bit of seed capital and, and uh, the mentorship, as well as the student flow, is uh, you know, if you don't have all of those and you don't yet have a sticky community, uh, get your guys married to local gals and 
who made that community sticky. <laughs> so that's a big part of what we did too, to really um, make sure that people know what, what excellent things there are to do in our community mm -hmm. uh, to keep them there. Um, uh, you know, what we found actually, a group of us got together and said, okay, well look, I mean, we're video games and we're a component of the Albany economy. There's, it's, not, it's not the natural identity of um, you know, what we do in upstate New York, you know, video games and that kind of thing. Uh, how big is this creative economy really? What does it really mean? And that's just, these are craft breweries, these are farm hotel restaurants, these are film companies, animation companies, people in marketing and media. It turns out that the creative economy is the fourth largest employer in our greater metropolitan region and employs over 25,000 people in our community. And Albany is not a huge area. Mm -hmm. uh, and I suspect that that actually is the case throughout the country. Mm -hmm. um, every one of these areas needs to sort of come together around a critical mass and some key concepts that really unlock a huge amount of economic potential. And if it happened in Albany, it can, can literally happen. I will say that. Yeah, we yeah. started from zero. Yeah. Well, you, you are finding in, in, in places like Albany, places like upstate New York, people are from their hometown and they don't necessarily want to leave. Or they went to college and they, and they fell in love with the town where they, where they are. Madison, Wisconsin is a town like that. If you've ever been to Madison, it is the quintessence of what you think of when you think of a college town. It's one of, one of the most beautiful campuses I've, I've ever seen. And uh, who would want to leave Madison? Uh, so, Constance, what's going on up there? And then I'd love for you to sort of relate, weave that into the, the work that you did at the White House and what you saw from that perspective with the creative economy. Sure. Well, you'll notice Madison may be a great place to live. It really is. But we're also a very anemic looking state on that map. So if there's any other Wisconsin people in here, I would love to have that conversation about like how do you mobilize within a state? Mm -hmm. um, so, you know, I got into games not because I actually was a big gamer, though I suspect that everyone in this room has played some version of a digital title and probably has it on their phone now and will use it on the Metro going home. But I got into games because I was very interested in what kids were doing with all of that time, right? You can show that kids in K through 12 spend more time playing games every day than they spend doing homework. So if there's that much time of investment, then what's happening cognitively developmentally, and it turns out that what's going on is pretty terrific. While we're all um, concerned about screen time, you know, games are this medium. It's this magical medium that turns screen time into doing time, into problem solving, into activity. So I spent a long time in my um, career sort of documenting what kids were doing and how it was productive for kids and how they were actually using media. There is no child these days unless they're truly sheltered that is not, doesn't have their hands in games. So um, I, from that I shifted to doing some policy work and the organization I lead right now is the Higher Education Video Game Alliance, HEGVA, <laughs> which is the worst acronym ever. So we just call it the Alliance. Um, because well, one thing that, that um, so in my own research it turns out that if you add games to say a typical K through 12 curriculum, you not only improve performance, you also improve retention and interest, which these days is really, really vital. Our, our um, kids that are even faring well in school uh, don't like school, and they don't think it's relevant, and they find it's boring. So you may be able to get them to perform on assessments, but you actually ruin their lifelong interest in wanting to learn about a topic. Games improve that situation. Well, what's really interesting is that if you look at the role of game design programs in higher ed, you have the exact same pattern emerge. So um, this organization that we founded about a year ago, we now represent about half of all of the higher ed programs that have game design in them. And we started doing some landscape analysis about what are the programs like, um, what are the impacts on campus, what happens to our alums, right? Do kids who graduate, college students, to young adults who graduate with a degree in game design, are they employable, are they happy? Well, it turns out that on campuses, first off, when you add game design to its adjacency fields in STEM, um, you end up attracting double the number of women and you retain those students at 88%. So what we found in terms of placing games in things like K through 12 curricula, it holds on college campuses as well. So you know, we can show in our programs, and it's, in some ways it's not surprising, right? You're adding creative arts to uh, computer game development, to dev, to computer science. And when you do that, you attract more people, more diverse people, and you keep them. Um, but it also turns out that our alums are doing um, 
very well. I'm really proud um, of some of the data that we've been able to show. So when we surveyed, for example, employ, uh, employment rates, salaries, uh, whether or not you're happy in your workplace, the stats are fairly surprising, even for an optimist like me. So it turns out that um, in our programs, we have 91.3% of an employment rate. That's 8% higher than a national average. Our salaries tend to be 76,000. That's $24,000 higher than the national average. About half of our graduates go into games industry. 55% go into some version of what you saw in Andy's slides, but 45% go into other fields. So a degree in game design, a degree in you know, game dev actually prepares you for fields as diverse as network security, over to education, to um, development, all sorts of fields. And when you ask, oh, but by the way, the, the salary, that elevated salary and employment rates, it's no difference whether you're going into industry or not. So our graduates do great whether they're hitting game scene or entering other domains, including politics and policy. Finally, um, we also asked about workplace happiness. So it's one thing to make a great salary. Uh, it's another thing to actually be glad for the degree that you got and feel that the career that you're in is, uh, is one that uh, is life enhancing and enriching. And it turns out that um, like 83% of our alumni reported in the thriving category. You can't get any higher in terms of job satisfaction. And again, what you find is that's true whether students are going into games industry or not. So the impact that we're having on campuses is pretty profound, I would argue, especially in topics like diversifying who goes into computer science, which I would argue is probably one of the biggest pressing issues we have um, in STEM-related fields right now. One of, one of the things when you talk to employers they talk about is not necessarily the jobs gap, but the skills gap and whether uh, tomorrow's workers are learning the STEM and STEAM skills that they're going to need to succeed in the 21st century digital economy. And um, your point is well taken about the interest of children in video games. You walk into an eighth grade uh, class and, and, and I have and say, who wants to go into video game design when you grow up? Every hand grows up, boy and girl. So they've not, and then you say, well, you know, algebra is, you know, you're going to need to know algebra. And you're going to need to know science. And you, and you start to talk to them, and they, A, they, they realize that that's actually a thing. You can actually work in video games when, 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 when you grow up. And, 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 and that's, that's, that's interesting. It's a good vector into a discussion on, on STEM and STEAM skills. But you also realize, then you ask how many people play Minecraft, and nearly every hand go, goes up, boys and girls. And you start talk to the, talking to them about what's involved in computer coding, and how when you're playing Minecraft and creating these worlds and these spaces, you're in many ways coding. And that becomes a much more interesting conversation than you've got to study math and science. That becomes something that they're actually interested in and engaged in. And then they stay in the, those study fields longer and they start to explore uh, these fields, uh, which leads us to Andy. And tell us a little bit about your students, what they're like when they enter, the type of students who enter, uh, what they're studying while they're there, both in undergraduate and masters, and then, uh, and, and then sort of where they go when they, when, when they leave. Sure. Um, and just to put a frame on this, I mean, let's let's recognize how titanic a shift this is, right? So when when I proposed that first course, right, I was told three things. Well, first, I was I was asked very politely by the uh, curriculum committee, if you're going to do games, could you please just not call it games? Because we don't want to give people the wrong idea of what we're doing, right? So it was, don't call it games. Um, no young woman will ever want to do this, uh, and no one will ever get a job. So that was the reaction to the initial proposal of in that era, right? And so fast forwarding to now, um, we, you know, we're a, a technical private university. We're one of the largest producers of STEM graduates in terms of private universities. Um, to give you a sense of scale, the College of Computing uh, at RIT is a separate academic thing. It's over 4,000 students just studying computing, right? Um, we tend to attract students that are um, very, very book smart. Uh, they tend to have had a lot of um, good experiences in their educational tr you know, uh, path up to that point. Um, what we find increasingly is that they haven't really been challenged deeply. Mm -hmm. um, but I don't mean that in terms of just like sort of raw, you know, memorizing facts or figures or that kind of stuff. The thing that a game program does that's unique is 
It asks you to learn skills and apply them in a context where there is no single formula or answer on how to solve that problem. Right? I can tell you, make the game fun. And there's a gazillion ways to do that. And not one of them is the right way that you can read in a book and then just go and do over and over again. And so this idea that they're taking tech skills and creative skills and applying them very specifically to want to achieve certain outcomes, that's really the thing that makes them valuable. That's the thing that employers come back and go, wow, we want to hire these, these graduates, right? And we don't necessarily just want to hire them for games, right? Uh, we want to hire them for a broad range of, of fields, anything where they're looking at the application of technology in, a, in kind of an unknown context, right? And that applies to healthcare, that applies to simulation, that applies to digital media, and the list goes on. Um, so that's really, I think in, in most of the really successful programs that I've studied, that's the transformation that happens, right? Is people come in expecting, oh, I'm gonna learn how to code, I'm gonna learn how to do this, I'm gonna learn how to do that, and there's a very set you know, curriculum on how to do that or what have you, and they're used to an educational system where they're gonna be assessed um, in large measure using a standardized instrument, and there's a way to, to mm -hmm. win at that instrument, right? And they're moving now increasingly into an environment where that's really almost entirely focused on team-driven, project-based, right? ill-defined set path to get there, but high energy, high impact work. Mm -hmm. yeah, hear, hearing this, I'm, I'm reminded of the book of Genesis. When you go through that genealogical tree where there's all the people begat, 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 Adam begat, and it's sort of, you know, you started, you started this program and it begat all these other programs. You started this, uh, th this company and it begat all of these, uh, this, this ecosystem in, New in, 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 in upstate New York. Uh, Texas begat this, uh, this incentive program for this fledgling young industry, and it begat, you know, 5,000 jobs and, and, and growing, you know, and Constance, your work at the White House, you know, begat all of these, these, these other verticals. Um, and, and we're now, you know, we're, you're talking about 406 different colleges and universities from one, or, or eight back, uh, you know, 20, was, 22, yeah. 23 years ago. And uh, uh, they begat 1,600 different companies in 1,800 locations all throughout. I think one of the things that, that people are interested in, and I'd love to get, we've got time for two more questions, um, and then maybe a question or two from the audience. But I think when you, you think about, you know, your bosses, and your districts and the districts and states that you represent. Uh, maybe you're, you're from a rural district and you're wondering how we can sort of recreate this with, within that district. Uh, or, or maybe you're from a district where, where there, there's something that's, grow, that's already uh, thriving and growing. Um, but we're more than happy, to, number one, to give you the statistics and the names of all of the companies in, in your, um, because we have broken this down not just by state, but by congressional district and we can give you that, that. but what, what is it that, that what advice, as, you, as you, you know, you're talking to the people in public policy who represent a broad range of, of, of geographies and demographics, what advice uh, as they think about growing the, the, the tech sector, the creative tech sector in, in, in their hometowns and home states would you give them? Who are you to start? Uh, sure. Um, you know, first of all, a big takeaway from this study, I think, is that it can happen, you know, anywhere. And uh, when we look at sort of uh, the creative economy, this kind of marriage of uh, creative industries with technology industries, it's a really broad-based phenomenon. Uh, and it is the face of modern manufacturing in the United States that's, bu that's business to consumer. So these are companies not just like video game companies, but also Nike or Apple or any number of small companies, craft breweries and so forth that have a unique creative proposition, the kind of things that can't be outsourced easily, the kind of things that command the largest amount of profit from any product. And those industries actually involve a ton of labor. It's not about the manufacturing and the product costs, it's about people living in those communities and locally investing. And so what we see in our area is that, um, you know, when we can really accelerate that by combining a community of entrepreneurs, the local success stories that are willing to pay it forward. And in every community you have the cast of players that have done well in their community that can do that and make a contribution. Um, now institutions are old, RIT's been around forever, uh, as is WISMAD and UT Austin. Uh, every community has an institution that has the sort of the core seeds of, okay, how do we get a newly trained labor force? How do we get this young population 
ready for this industry. Uh, and that's really why you see this kind of dramatic shift in terms of the educational profile and game degree programs and that kind of thing. Um, getting those to work with the entrepreneurs and then starting with some seed capital and then really investing in making the community sticky. You know, what's at stake with this is not just like hey, make, make some more video games and this kind of thing. It's where do 25 to 35 year olds decide to settle down? Mm -hmm. And where they make that choice will determine the prosperity of that community. So the communities that are really sticky, that are doing a good job of doing that, will have a great 25 years coming up. The communities that aren't actively investing in that will hear a giant sucking sound, both from their institutions, as well as just have an aging population without a supporting workforce. So this is happening all around the country. The communities that are doing well, Austin is excellent at this. Uh, but also we're seeing you know, good traction in Rochester. We're seeing good traction in Albany. And it was a really surprising finding to find out that that's actually the fourth creative economy is the fourth largest economic sector in our area. Yeah, there are a lot of surprises on, uh, uh, on this map. One of the things that's, that's worked extraordinarily well is, is um, you know, we talk about the importance of incubators and, and accelerators. Also, uh, tax incentives work extraordinarily well. And uh, there are 21 states around the country that have passed tax incentives to grow the video game industry in, in their state. Texas is, is, at the for, is at the forefront of all of those. And your incentive covers not just our industry, but also the film and television and commercial industry. Do you want to talk about how that worked and how that, how that, uh, sure. how that has, has, has grown things there? Sure. Um, I think that it's probably pretty instrumental to our more recent growth particularly um, in helping smaller companies. Uh, the base level of uh, spending that a company needs to do in Texas is $100,000. And that's not a really expensive uh, game to develop. And it provided a lot of opportunity for some real startups, small companies, two, three, five people to start out. And um, our incentive program is different from most states in that the more you spend, the greater percentage of uh, your spending you get back. We're a grant program. We just cut a check at the end after auditing books uh, to make sure that the expenditures were Texas expenditures. So, um, you know, uh, the state did not put out a lot of money in incentives that really helped get some people on. Uh, 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 on the ground. Um, five person, three person companies that um, made a $200,000 game and we would give them either 5% or 7.5% if their business was located in a underutilized area or a place that was, uh, you know, economically depressed. Um, that gave you a little bump um, to try and motivate production in areas outside of Austin and Dallas. And they really had a really big impact on a lot of the startups taking place uh, 10 years ago. Uh, the program is a, started in 2008 for us, so um, eight years ago. Um, and that's really had a huge, huge impact. One of the other things that also had a huge impact for us is we don't have um, uh, income tax. And so when we were trying to get um, talent that wasn't necessarily entry-level talent, we were able to recruit that talent to the state because they were able to keep uh, their wages, more of their wages. And so those two factors really have played in a lot to getting the company started. Once they get there, they grow. And one of the nice things about their growth is if they're growing in, in a state uh, whether it's the city or whether it's state-wise, the stickiness that you're talking about, um, where if you're finished with the job or your business takes a hiatus as they develop their next program, um, you can move without having to leave the state. There's a place for you to go as an employee if, if something were to happen to the startup. You don't have to pick up and move to Seattle. Um, and, you know, when you make it, you, you know, you'd like it not to have to make that kind of change in your life all the time. And um, Texas creates that opportunity for folks. Um, and we've been, with the incentive program, we've also been able to help create uh, pockets that you wouldn't otherwise think would be video game uh, development pockets, like Corpus Christi, which is a port town. The last place in the world I would imagine that to be happening. But there's actually a, a game development community down there and some companies and animation companies, and that is a very creative, interesting town that's trying to revitalize itself, 
and they do see the value uh, locally and also we see it at a state level of being supportive of that. And so that's what we do at the Film Commission to try and you know, help companies grow into two and three and 400 um, employee companies that we are now seeing from those companies that we started helping eight years ago. Yeah, it's, it's incredible. It's an incredible growth story, as is this incredible growth story. Any questions from the audience before, before we uh, wrap up? Yes. The question was about a growing, the growing trend in technology. What do you see as the growing trends in technology coming up? Okay. Relative to this space. Yeah, I think relative to this space, and branching out from it. Uh, go ahead. Well, actually, I'm interested in your answer because some <laughs> of the students experiment. You know, one of the awesome things about um, student projects is that they. Uh, get really wacky. They can experiment with things that are not yet viable commercially, so some of the most interesting ideas actually come out of the schools. Yeah, I mean, I think one of the things that we're seeing, broadly speaking, right, is a, is a um, an ever lowering of the bar of what it takes to produce content and distribute content, right? And that, that seems easy to say, um, but it's happening now at a pace that, that is surprising to all of my friends that have been in the industry for a while. Right, because I remember how hard it was to make a game, mm -hmm. right? Just not too many years ago, right? Mm -hmm. And at this point, uh, I don't want to say it's easy because it's not. It's a hugely labor-intensive because it's a creative thing. But but the labor is about the content, right? You're you're not fighting with the tools and the technologies to the extent that you were. Um, that's continuing to get interesting. Uh, I think there's right now a, the jury's kind of out, but. We're figuring out new platforms in ways that we haven't in a while. For a while, it was you're going to have a big screen on the wall in your house, and that's how you're going to play games. Um, and then mobile broke that. And then I think we're going to put weird things on our faces, and that's going to break it again. Um, and I don't know exactly what that's going to look like, and I don't think anybody has those answers easily. Um, but we're the, the, this business about new devices and the combinations of new devices to consume content um, like I'm looking at what our students are doing and they are doing exactly that they're doing really weird things that nobody's really ever tried before um, but out of that something is going to spark right that kind of that kind of activity having that little space to play mm -hmm. you know without sort of the commercial constraints right is one of the things that education is really good for um, and so you know we are getting things where people are saying you know can you combine haptic force force feedback gloves with VR and try to like physically touch a thing that's not there, right? And that kind of stuff um, for an entertainment product, right? As opposed to a you know a military product or what have you. So uh, it's interesting. Uh, I think you know, the things that I picked up uh, that I pick up these days are, you know, one is the, the distribution. How you get a game to market is very different yep. than it used to be. It used to be ship boxes and CDs. Now digital distribution has a profound implication. It's not just the app that you download on your phone. But it means that you can create a, uh, you can make a creative work that is not strictly a video game that's played on a screen. You can have intelligent toys. You can have, um, you can have a soap dish that speaks to you. You know, you, it's a sort of like a, a penetration of, you know, sort of what we do as creative people, but into every part of your lifestyle. Not to make it all techy, but to make it much more usable make you support your, the habits that you want, and that kind of thing. And so we see a transformation from, let's make a game like Pac-Man, which of course was 30 years ago, to let's make all kinds of, not only entertainment, but creative work that sort of bridges the things that we were used to doing in our lifestyle to um, you know, new ways of engaging with it, you know, electronically. So digital distribution is a big deal. Cloud computing, you've heard in a lot of different places. But as it relates to this, it, it's that, well, look, the computing doesn't have to be in the soap dish. It could be on your phone if you make a device smart. The Internet of Things really applies to our industry as much as anything else. So these two phenomena working together actually will profoundly change the way we do things. Yeah, I think the, the one other thing I would note is the when the technology was very difficult to develop and hard to use, the stories that we told were pretty simplistic. 
right? And, and we've seen over the growth of, of the games industry, those, those stories have, have become richer, have become deeper, this kind of stuff. But I think the thing that's happening now, and particularly the explosion of the indie scene, is that not everybody wants the same entertainment product. That there are markets out there for very different kinds of stories, for very different kinds of communities, for very different kinds of, of um, I, I hesitate to even use the term player, because in some cases that may not apply. Um, but the stories that we want to look at as communities and consume as media as, you know, as a, as a much richer set of consumers, uh, I think that's ever expanding. And so that is changing the t the, both the tech and the dev and the way that things are built as well. Because people want to tell different stories. And utilize technology to do, to do so. Uh, any other questions from the audience before we do a real brief wrap, wrap up with the panel? Oh, and and uh, by thanking everybody again, thank you for your attention. Uh, thanks again to uh, the, the chairs of the E-Tech Caucus, uh, Lamar Smith, Debbie Wasserman Schultz, Adam Kinzinger, and Jim McGovern, uh, and their continued leadership. Just end, Constance, with one question. You've got a unique perch on, on, on all of this um, at, as the head of a Higher Education Video Game Alliance. Where are we going to be in five years? What's this map going to look like? And uh, as you look out at those 200 institutions that are part of HEVGA, uh, what do you see those kids uh, and the students creating? What's the, world, what's the world that you're going to unveil for us? Well, I mean, one thing that's remarkable is that without these kinds of data, we think that the scene is only happening in California and New York. And number one, it's not. I mean, games really are um, a, in a long line of interactive media, and things are only becoming more and more interactive. Audience expects it. So in some ways, I think that the games industry is sort of on that leading edge. It's the technology. I mean, who watches like Walking Dead? All of America watches Walking Dead. Did you notice that now you play a game and try to survive while you're, you know, while you're watching the current episode of Walking Dead? That is now the expectation. Even my grandmother plays yeah. games. Made in Texas. Um, yeah. <laughs> in Texas, too. So I think that what you're seeing is actually more of a distribution. Um, and I, I think that uh, game programs are pushing on the university side. They're kind of pushing the universities to figure out ways to better um, monetize their research and their development and get it off campus and figuring out ways to partner better for ecosystems in their environments. So for example, you know, some of the game development that Andy students may do, thinking about how to take it from a prototype or a vertical on a campus that's a student project and out to product. Because behind that product is a business and behind that business are employees. And for many of these states that are still a little bit anemic on the map, that kind of equation can be the winning equation for revitalizing certain areas of your districts and your state. So I think that's the way it's going to be heading. And we were, an, I mean, we were as anemic as the next guy 10 years ago. Mm -hmm. And look our, where we are because people really decided that this was worth a little bit of investment mm -hmm. and a, lot, a little bit of energy and time and focus. And most of the companies that started out during that time period are really solid, bigger companies now. And quite frankly, we're really going to blow up here soon. Uh, we are looking to really increase Texas uh, for that production because we got to a certain level of scale. And now that we're there, um, now every, all the schools want to, you know, it's, it's this beautiful cycle that you see. Schools are coming around and everybody wants to have the program. And because they see what's happening in their local communities and the kids don't want to leave the state. They want to work in there. And then, you know, the companies that started with five and 10 employees are now at 150 employees. And they're all about to go from mini majors to, you know, being majors themselves. And it's just a very exciting time um, just because of a little belief and focus and some, certainly at least from the state of Texas, a little bit of help um, to help these guys along. Is it the case, uh, Heather, I think uh, there's a one to nine economic multiplier or something like that for the Texas program? That's from the There has been, yes. Yes, mm -hmm. it's been really very high. Yeah, mm -hmm. for every one dollar the state of Texas invests, you get nine out in terms of economic productivity. Mm -hmm. For the game industry. For the, for the game industry, mm -hmm. yeah. Now, Heather's talked a lot about Texas, and we'll end with this, but what she's not talking about is her hometown of Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania, 
which we share in common along with the love of the Steelers. And Pittsburgh was, uh, was a town that 30 years ago was written off for dead. The steel mills had closed in, 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 the, in the early 80s and people were moving out in droves. And um, the Wall Street Journal recently did an article called The Robot That Saved Pittsburgh about Carnegie Mellon's robotics program and what that did to plant the seed to revitalize that. And now Pittsburgh is an epicenter for movie making. As Jesse Shell will take, tell you, it's an epicenter for, for, for video gaming. Uh, there is a renaissance. It is, it is in many ways the new Brooklyn. Before Brooklyn was Brooklyn, it was, you know, it was just this, this, this run down Rust Belt kind of stepsister across the river from, from, from Manhattan. This is happening in Lexington, Kentucky. It's happening all throughout, uh, it's happening in Detroit. We talked a lot about Detroit this morning. It's happening all throughout the country. This is one industry that's at the center of it, and oftentimes it is the leading economic indicator, but it, it, it's, going, it's going nationwide, it's gone nationwide, it's coming to a community near you if it isn't already there. If it isn't already there, talk to us and we'll help out. So thank you so much for your time and attention and uh, we'll be here for a little while afterwards. Thanks.